YouTube channel. Uh, today we're going to take a little bit of a, an excursion away from what I did in the first two uh, videos that I put out. Uh, for those of you who may or may not be aware, I am a fairly recently retired uh, school shop teacher, high school shop teacher. <clears throat> um, June 30th, 2023 was my last day. Uh, capped off a 32 year career which I enjoyed immensely. I really loved working in the shop with students. Um, in order to kind of carry on that tradition, um, I've been working on another thing kind of behind the scenes here with the help of a good friend. Uh, a lot of the, well, in fact, at some point, all the safety units that I wrote uh, on my own time with my own dime will eventually be on a teacher website called Teachers Pay Teachers. Uh, if you're interested in uh, any of the content that you're going to hear about today, uh, you can go to TeachersPayTeachers.com and search RLBR Custom Creations and sometimes adding the, the term Industrial Arts helps and uh, my units should pop up. Not everything is there yet, I'm still in the process of working on it, but uh, I decided that I would shoot this little video today, basically how to use the safety sheet or the poster that I'm supplying with that unit. So that's what today's video is going to be about. Now, the safety units that I've been publishing on Teacher Pay Teacher basically include a few things. First of all, you get a poster, and I, we're going to go through setting this up today. Then I would have created an assignment based on that, an assignment key, a test, and a test key. Now, we're going to talk a little later in the video about liability and things like that, but it's, it's a fairly tricky subject to be able to come up with a system that you feel is going to be uh, enough to, if you would have, say, an accident in the shop, that it would be enough to prevent you, well, I don't know prevent, but look good uh, if your case, if you got sued or something and um, you had to defend your actions. And I think this paperwork starts to form the basis for a comprehensive safety system. So that's what we're going we're gonna to talk about putting the safety uh, placard together today. Uh, you may have just noticed my furnace turning off in the shop. Um, it's been really cold here lately. In fact, this morning when I checked my phone to see what the temperature was in our community, uh, with wind chill it was minus 50. So the heater's running a little bit more. Uh, I turn it down for night so it has to warm everything up. But if you, if the, I hope it doesn't affect the sound a whole lot. Um, getting back to the, to the liability aspect a little bit. During my career, I found that that was difficult to get any direct help with that. Nobody seemed to want to talk about it, but I had the feeling that if things would, were to go bad in the shop, and thank goodness they never did for me, but I know of people that did have experience with that, um, I really felt that I needed to protect myself. I wasn't sure how much support I would get. So I researched and researched, and finally I got lucky. The, I've been a member of the Saskatchewan Woodworkers Guild for many, many years, and one evening they invited a lawyer from one of the legal firms in Saskatoon to talk about shop liability and injuries. And this particular lawyer, uh, I really enjoyed that, that evening because uh, he answered a number of my questions. Uh, not to get into everything he said directly, but what I took away from his discussion with us is that as a teacher, I needed to do a few things. 
First of all, <clears throat> there needed to be a paper trail. So that meant an assignment, which I provided my units, and a key for that, and a test, and a test key. So what I did when, when I was um, still teaching is, this is gonna sound a little bit strange, but I, I think I can justify it. What I eventually did is let the kids correct their own test. So they go through the assignment, they, it's basically a fill in the blank assignment, kind of a reading survey. The test is true and false, so they'd go through and do the true and true and false test. And then I would get them to write the test in pencil, using a pencil, correct it with pen. And I supervised that very carefully. And can I say definitively that nobody cheated? I don't know. I, but I'm quite, quite happy with the results that we generated. Um, so that way, the way I looked at it was, I can now bring those kids into the shop, even the ones who did quite poorly on the test, and most of them did quite well. Um, they made, but they have made their corrections. So I took that to mean that I had done my due diligence on the paper side, and we were now ready to go into the shop and move on to the other stuff. So one of the things that he mentioned, uh, basically taking the actions of a reasonable person. So I tried to incorporate that into the safety planning that I did. However, once your paper trail is established, which I think is important, uh, and I kept, we, in, in our school division, we were required to keep all tests on file for a year. So I did that, and um, I was quite satisfied with the way that worked out. Once the paper side was done, then it was time to go into the shop. And again, taking away from that lawyer's discussion of what my responsibilities were, to me, I interpreted it as I needed to do a demonstration. So I would, um, in fact, on this channel, I'll, I'll start doing demonstrations, and I think the first one I'll do will be the bandsaw. So I would take my students into the shop as a group. I hope that isn't bothering you guys too much. And uh, I would go to the bandsaw, and I would make a rip cut, a cross cut, uh, explain some of the more important safety rules, more critical ones to using the saw, and then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and then the demo phase was done. Usually on another day, we, the next day we'd come back into the shop, then it was time for their guided practice. So they got to use the saw with me standing directly by it. Okay, I was my focus was on them. And then you could correct little, little problems that arose, which I thought was really, really good. So I would correct technique at those guided sessions. And usually by then I got them started on their project, so they were either looking for wood, but when they were ready to come to the bandsaw, I would be there and I would guide them through it. Once, as a teacher, once you're satisfied with their ability through the guided practice, then they could use the tool with my permission. Now, <laughs> uh, yeah, permission. So I had some students that didn't ask for permission really well. But luckily I was in the phase of my career already where I watched the shop quite effectively. And if I was looking around the shop and somebody looked, was going to the band saw or in high school the table saw, I would watch them and I could see what they were doing. They were usually more competent by then and yeah, maybe I shouldn't have, but I let it slide a little bit. Because I didn't want to go and yell, not yell at them, but constantly remind them to keep asking me. And then, well then, if they don't ask, well then what do you do? So anyway, I, that was later in my career, I just, I just let them go, but I was always watching. Uh, what I did not want is a tool to start up without me knowing about it. So that was the, the whole idea. Um, so yeah, uh, basically 
that was what was important as far as me getting where I felt comfortable that I had done my due diligence to make sure that my students had a good, a very high chance of success in the shop. Now, one of the other reasons I'm going to start shooting videos related to teaching in the shop is that in my particular province, uh, shop, to my knowledge, they are not training new shop teachers at the university anymore. They haven't now, I think, for a number of years. They've gone through several phases of this in my career, and unfortunately, uh, we're not training teachers. And that's too bad. Because in my opinion, industrial arts is one of the most important subjects you can take in high school. I know the math and the English people will be down my throat with that comment. Don't get me wrong, their stuff's important too. But aside from maybe introducing kids to a career in the trades, which is certainly noble and certainly desirable around here, um, I think it does something else. I think with the right guidance, it's the perfect place to let students be creative, which, uh, okay, if math isn't a subject, you can be creative. Uh, creative answers don't usually do well in math. But in the shop, creativity is everything. And the other thing I think it's really, really good at teaching is practical problem solving. So, I think those, those things need to be passed on to our students. And what concerns me when the province isn't training new teachers, what's the future for this program? Now, thank goodness when I retired, I kind of did a little bit of shoulder tapping and there's a very, very good shop teacher right in our community that was working somewhere else. And he is now teaching in our school. So our school is in good hands. But these units and this stuff, it's for everybody. But I'm really thinking about maybe the phys ed teacher who gets shoulder tapped. So you're going to be in the shop this semester uh, or this year. You're in little schools like ours. If you're the shop teacher, you're, the, you're it. You're the shop department. So that's why I'm going to put this stuff out there. Now these units, um, there is a little bit of a charge for them. So for a safety sheet, an assignment, a test, sorry, safety sheet, assignment, assignment key, test and test key, they're available at teacherpayteacher.com for $4.99 US per unit. So that's, that would, for me, if I would have got pushed into teaching shop and needed something right away, uh, $4.99 would have been a steal. But anyway, uh, let's get on to um, the purpose of today's video, which is to make one of these. Okay, in the, the unit that I'm selling, you would end up printing, we're going to do the bandsaw today. So this is what you print. Hopefully you have access to a color printer because I think the color is important. So you get a sheet like that, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna turn it into a placard like this. Now, if you worked in a, a school where you had budget, and let's say uh, your school decided to put this on every tool like I did, the best way to do it would probably be to print it on vinyl or something, like a more, uh, a more commercial way of putting these together. However, if you have limited budget and you need to get things going, uh, this works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting one of these together. Okay, now this is another copy of my bandsaw safety sheet. Notice I've trimmed, I've trimmed the edges because I don't like that much white. And actually I made a mistake when I photocopy these. The other thing is I'm, I'm slowly weaning myself from school. I had the luxury of having a color copier at school, so I would 
I had a sheet with these um, yellow safety bars on them, and I'd set my stuff in the middle, and I'd put it down, and I'd copy it. So I got this safety bar or edge on there that way. Now, I think all I did with the safety edge is downloaded it from, I think, some of the graphics in Word or something like that. It's nothing, it's, it's common. So you could do that too. What I'm going to do today is I just happen to have a little bit of safety, reflective safety tape left over from my trailer build. So I'm just going to stick that on the edges so it looks like this in the end. Now the other thing about doing this for, for shop teachers, in my opinion, shop teachers are probably the most creative and best problem solving teachers out there. So if you decide on another way of doing this, that's totally up to you. I'm just showing you what I did and one way of doing it. Okay, so I cut, for those of you who are concerned about measurements, uh, this, my safety sheet is cut to se about seven and three eighths wide by I think it's 10 and 5 eighths tall. Just ch check that out. Oops, that's the zero there. Yeah, 10 and 5 eighths tall. Now you notice I have no safety border at the top and bottom. So it, the, the actual board itself, and what I used for this, and I didn't have a piece of it to, in my shop to put this together, but I used um, eighth inch tempered hardboard and my local lumberyard would supply it to me. It had one side that was white, it was painted. And what I did is I always put that to the back and it just made a really nice clean back. Not that that matters all that much. Okay, so I got everything cut. I took the liberty of doing that beforehand. Now I'm gonna to try to do some uh, glue application here without making a terrible mess of everything. And I hope my glue actually works. So I'm, here we go, here, here it goes. Let's see if this works. Okay, we're just gonna spray the back. Oh, come on, there we go. Okay, stop, there we go, see it listens. Okay, so we're gonna let that dry a little bit. Ooh, this is just uh, Elmer's spray adhesive. I would recommend the cheapest spray adhesive you can get because it, it, it doesn't matter that much. Okay, and then I'm going to spray the backer as well. <laughs> okay, you'll notice, I don't know if you can see them, I took the liberty of making some marks on here so I know where I'm going when I start to put this together. <clears throat> That's probably the hardest part of everything here is putting this together. Now, I like, I would call it a permanent bond. I like to leave these until they're really, really tacky. In other words, letting them dry a little bit. Now this operates a lot like a contact cement but I usually don't let it dry completely. And you wanna make sure that you don't get any glue transfer from your fingers to the top. This is quite uh, susceptible to the elements just yet. And boy, can I get this. Not too bad. Not too bad on live television here coming to you from my shop in wall time. <clears throat> That'll do. Okay, so now it's on a rigid backer board. All right, now I didn't get everything here completely square. This top isn't quite the way I like it, but that'll do. The other thing that I like is, and I think you should have these in your shop, these, I think they're called self-healing mats. I'm not a craft person. My wife certainly is though. But Princess Auto, if you're in Canada, Princess Auto has these in surplus and they're cheap. So anyway, just my, my normal Princess Auto plug here. <clears throat> okay, then 
like I said, if I would have done this the way I made these, I wouldn't have to do this step. But for this one, I'm just going to show you another way of doing it. Uh, I had, I built it a um, uh, 14 foot utility trailer, tandem axle, a few years ago, and I have this left over from it. So when I was hunting through the shop yesterday, I found it. Uh, okay, what I should have done is I should have caught one of these ends so that I didn't have to waste our time on camera here trying to separate this. And this is going to be a challenge. Ay, ay, ay. This isn't good. Sorry about that, everyone. I should have gotten a little bit ahead of the game on this here. There we go. Now, I don't want it to, to spring and touch itself. Oh, we were lucky there. Okay, so I'm gonna get it in my hands the right way. And I'm going to... Put it on the edge like that. Okay, that's not perfect. But it gives you an idea of what I'm doing. So that's one. All right, let's do the other one here. Okay, well, we'll see if we can. I hope the furnace isn't. Uh, interrupting the video too much, but uh, yeah, it's been really, really cold here for the last while, and uh, it just runs a bit more. Okay, we got it. Ooh, that's, that worked nicely. Okay. We're getting there. Okay, now the problem is you've got a paper surface and it's going to be in the shop. That isn't going to work. So, my wife used to work at a library and they were getting rid of all of their, I don't know if you remember these from the, the days when schools had libraries, they would uh, protect paperback books with this stuff. So I brought home a few sheets for me and I've been using that up slowly. But it's uh, it's heavy enough it makes a good protector for these. Again, there's a million ways you could do this. Uh, plexiglass, if you have the budget for it, might be better. But um, well, here we'll just set it there for now. But uh, this I found works really well and is very durable. This isn't that critical. You just want to make sure it covers all of it, set it on, and rub it in good. Okay, when it's on, like it is now, flip it over, take your trusty utility knife, and run along the edge. Oops, just about dropped it. And cut it off. off the face 
and now it's, it's durable. However, the one thing that I was concerned about is the, the edge, getting over, getting, you know, over the, on the edge and being able to flick it off. So what I did to uh, prevent that is I took packing tape and I would put packing tape over the edges like this. So what this does is it kind of bonds the edge, wraps it up. Okay, so okay, we'll put that there like that. And then carefully lift it up and make sure it goes over tight before it sticks on the back side. I have a little bit of a ridge in there, but I think it will be okay. Okay, so that, that makes that edge a little harder to, to flake off. Okay, let's do that again. Put some more sides to do. use this one unless I find my bandsaw one. It's funny, when I moved out of the school I took all this stuff with me. <laughs> Did you think I could find the bandsaw and the scroll saw sheets? I don't know, they oh no I lost it. They have just disappeared. So maybe once I get more organized I'll find it. But for now I'll run with Okay, so the sides are done. Let's do the ends. Okay, here we go. Come on, there we go. Wish I had a dispenser. All right, so fold that over. One more to go. I'll clean up after we're done. One more edge. I don't know. I try to get the tape edge to line up with a line on the paper. I don't think it's that critical, but I tend to be a little fussy with things that I do, so sorry about that, but that's just the way I do it. Okay, so over it goes. And that's that. So we have now generated a durable safety placard that is fit to be used in your wood shop. Now, when I made these for the welding area, I used what was that, 20, 22 gauge sheet metal for this backer. I cut it with a shear, it worked beautifully. So that's done. Now the other thing to talk about quickly is where do you put these? Well, by the time I got everything set up, we were on the verge of putting dust collection in our shop. Yes, I basically worked years. Yeah, probably 20 years in our shop with no dust collection. So by the time I had this figured out and had these made, we were just getting to the point where they were installing things in the shop. And once we had dust collection in there, I just mount this, I'd make a bracket and mount it on the dust collection downpipes. So it was right by the saw. And I put this right by the saw. So for example, I've got a scroll saw here. What I would have done and what I did do with our uh, six scroll saws in the school shop is I put 
is right there. It's very important that this is posted on the tool so that kids remember this and see it. And because everything's unified and integrated, uh, I think it's, it's very, very important that it's mounted on the tool or near the tool so that it can be visible when kids are using the tool. So, uh, if you have to mount yours directly to, let's say, the bandsaw to the upper, the upper guard, or no, sorry, the upper housing, I would put it on with rare earth magnets. So what I often did with, with equipment or with signage like this is I would take, holy mackerel, these things are stuck together. I would take four, I may not get four apart here, but I would take four rare earth magnets and epoxy them onto the back. And that's, okay, that's two there. Can I separate them? They look like they're epoxy together. Anyway, so I would do that and then I would stick it to the upper, the upper wheel housing on the bandsaw and that works well as well. But if you have dust collection in your school, you might want to look at some different avenues to do this. Um, I guess kind of in closing, because we are done now. I'm just gonna get rid of these magnets. There we go. Um, I used the term unified or integrated earlier. I maybe didn't explain that well. So the way I use these signs and my safety unit is what frustrated me when I got students into the shop in grade seven and we'd go through the scroll saw safety rules in the book we were using is that, okay, there, there were grade seven safety rules, and then in grade nine, we changed books, and then there were different rules again. Like, a lot, of the, a lot was common, but there was a lot that's different, and I thought that was confusing for kids. So what I have done is I have one set of rules for the scroll saw, and for any tool that I've done. So one set of rules. It's in grade seven. They see it the first time if they, well, in grade seven, they had no choice when I was there. They used the scroll saw, so they took the safety for it. But let's say you want to click in and do intarsia in grade 10. Well, so you haven't done the scroll saw safety for three years. Well, it's time to review it anyway. So they would do the same stuff, totally integrated. The rules never changed. So, and every student, even if they had done everything the year before, we did, a, we did a refresher on this every year. So that way I felt quite comfortable that we were doing due diligence when it came to safety. Um, it allowed for me to relax a bit more and maybe I was lying to myself, but telling myself that yes, I have done everything that I can think of that a reasonable shop teacher would do. And I think that's important. So I hope I didn't bore you too badly with this one. Like I said, there's going to be a lot of different content on this channel. Uh, this maybe is a little bit more relevant for teachers, but there will be quite a bit of that. And not only just teachers, like if you're retired and you're starting out in your own shop or, or you're retired and your wife is sick and tired of you in the house already, which I understand, um, you bought a lathe and you don't know how to use it? Well, keep watching. We'll do lathe safety. I'll start doing tool demos as well. And it's very, very important. This is a wonderful introduction in school shops, for example, for, for kids to maybe get involved in making a living uh, building houses or welding trailers together or whatever it is. Drafting houses, designing, whatever they do. But it's also very good for people who just want to do this as a hobby and want to make sure that they that they don't have any of those trips to the emergency room. So, with that being said, uh, please like and subscribe. I think last I checked, I had I had ten subscribers. So hey, we're we're heading upwards. Three three videos. Uh, please subscribe, help me to grow this channel into something that uh, when I get out here and start shooting video, I don't feel like I'm 
doing it for nothing. Like not monetarily, but for, for people watching. I, I always, when I was teaching and I was preparing to, to do um, a special lecture at a, a little conference or something, and I was well prepared and five people would show up for that, that seminar. I thought, you know, hardly pays. And it affected the way I worked. So please subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions, post them in the comments. I'm trying to get better at going into the, my channel every day and checking to see if there's any activity. Uh, pretty dormant yet. But uh, if you're a, a teacher and this interests you, please tell your colleagues about this. There will be more coming. And you can check out uh, teacherpayteacher.com if you're interested in purchasing any of the resources that I've talked about today. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you next week.